uh, to uh, attempt to gain patients for a, a treatment modality that has a certain uh, uh, fear to it that's greater than, uh, than, than, than having your chest open. And so that was not the hard part. We had to exercise judgment in, in whom uh, we were willing to apply this with the limited capability of the material to start. But uh, it wasn't hard to find patients. It was much harder to convince colleagues in the establishment and, uh, and outside the establishment, and by establishment, I, I mean the academic uh, centers. Uh, we had some people that were very interested and very cooperative from the beginning, and we had many people who were so skeptical that they thought this was an outrageous way to uh, approach coronary vascular disease for five to six, seven, eight years. And you told me you, you, you recognized earlier this was a true breakthrough in treating of cardiovascular disease, but either in the months leading up to that first coronary angioplasty or in the years after, did you have any second thoughts, any second, any misgivings that maybe in fact you weren't on the right track, that this procedure was not going to be as valuable a clinical advance as you'd originally thought? No, I think I can honestly say that I didn't invent this procedure and I didn't do the first procedure except in America. That was Andreas Grunzig, who uh, did so again. Uh, were he here today, he'd be the first to tell you that his ideas came from Zeidler and so on and so forth, who worked in the periphery and daughter. But it was really Andreas that, uh, that did this. However, I will say that um, as soon as I saw this data, uh, I knew that this was going to be here to stay. I just did. and. Um, uh, I felt the same way about stents uh, only after I really saw uh, what uh, uh, Colombo was able to do to decrease the anticoagulation uh, because that, that was, that, that was uh, dragging on as a, as a problem for quite a while, although when that really clarified uh, the use of a stent, I think that uh, uh, the, the same curtain lifted for me. But as far as angioplasty was concerned, I can remember in 1978 telling a press conference that, look, uh, if we found a way to create a, um, a two-year additional lifespan in somebody with leukemia or pancreatic cancer, it would be applied in everybody, even if it worked for two years. So my biggest concern was that maybe this would work for two years and then we'd be back to square one. I didn't know what would happen. I didn't know anything about restenosis when we started, uh, except that it probably took place in the first six months, which we uh, th then learned uh, was actually the case. And, but that's about all we knew about it. And my concern was it wouldn't be permanent and we wouldn't find a way to make it permanent. Uh, but as far as it's making a huge difference in the blood flow to the myocardium by just this balloon being inflated to X number of times the uh, four or five times the pressure in your, in your tires, as soon as I saw some objective data, I knew that was going to be a, a, a new industry. You mentioned before that you developed a brachial catheter. It seems that you fairly quickly began to look not just at the procedure, but at the technology that we needed to make the procedure better. Talk about how and why you got interested in the device technology side of, of this procedure. I, I think we all did. The original nucleus of uh, five or six people that started doing this with Andreas um, uh, were always uh, aware of the fact that uh, uh, that whatever we were using was going to be uh, part of, uh, in, in the modern day parlance, a product cycle that was going to be very short. Mm -hmm. We knew that we needed better equipment, and so we were always on the lookout for something that would make it easier. S some of us were more ingenious than others, like Dr. Simpson and Dr. Yock, but, uh, you know, <laughs> but we were always looking out for it. <laughs> So talk about some of the early initial advances and some of the places that you went. Eventually, you're going to get to AVE and, and this coronary stent. But talk about some of the steps all along the way that, that got us to the point where you were playing a greater and greater role in technology development. Well, as I say, we, uh, uh, once we got established uh, as well-known people in interventional cardiology, I moved back to California uh, at the... Uh, uh, request of my ex-partner, Dr. Myler, and, um, and I worked with him for 10 years before uh, going to Stanford 10 years ago. 
And um, I, I have to say, in fairness, that uh, once we were established as so-called uh, pioneers in a field whose names were known, people will bring you technology, and some of which you uh, don't want to look at, and other things you, uh, you say, geez, this is a very good idea, but what you need is to take it, you know, and turn it that way, and they go back, and uh, two months later, they, they come with something that uh, you suddenly think is ingenious. So I think there's a feedback once you get into a position where people show you technology and continually bring you technology, uh, it, um, uh, it begins to have a momentum of its own. You and I were talking, <clears throat> you'd made the point that in those days, before ACS really began to take off, USCI had the, the monopoly is not too large, but at, at really the large domain in this space. And it, it, it seemed to me that it was not your intent to be an entrepreneur from the very beginning, but that you expressed the notion that USCI was not as proactive in working with physicians as they might have been to capitalize on that early uh, foothold. Well, I don't know how to put that. <laughs> I wouldn't put it that way. <laughs> I'd say that USCI was um, the, uh, the only company in, uh, let's say, 1978 that was making diagnostic cardiac catheters. Uh, Cordis was very close behind, and I think Cordis uh, didn't start doing that, and apologies if this is not temporarily chronologically correct, <laughs> but I think Judkins had to come first uh, before the Cordis catheters, and I think that was 1967. So for about uh, uh, two or three years, uh, give or take, USCI was the only repository, uh, they were the only people who would listen to us to take uh, a woven Dacron catheter, make one that was a guiding catheter, and then Judkins uh, came along with, uh, in, the, in, uh, in the 60s, coronary angiography, and very quickly, when Cordis got wind of angioplasty, they, they started to make guiding catheters as well. And so, um, uh, and it's very clear that the Judkins technique has, by and large, for training and day-to-day -day purposes, kind of driven out that brachial approach, and probably rightfully so, from. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, spoken from the lips of somebody who really was married to the brachial technique in the uh, mm -hmm. in the seventies, early seventies. Mm -hmm. So, in 1990, AVE was formed. Uh, talk to us about what you were doing in the decade of the 1980s in terms of both technology development and procedure development. Were you were you working with other companies? Were you working with startup companies to develop new technology? Were you basically waiting for technology to be developed that you could that you could use that other people were developing? No, I think uh, uh, during the period prior to the formation of AVE, uh, my attitude towards um, uh, startup business was that uh, if it came along and was appropriate, I would do it. But basically, I was interested in doing five cases a day as well as I could and making sure that I had the most uh, advanced uh, technical tools to do that. And if I could contribute to somebody else's bringing me an advanced technical tool, I would do that. Uh, it turned out that in the late uh, um, 80s, uh, I, I had worked on a number of stents uh, that, um, uh, that weren't very successful designs. And then uh, I saw a design that looked to me to be uh, very successful. and. Um, that was a separate project because we had many projects. I was at San Francisco Heart Institute at the time. And uh, one project that had nothing to do with stents was uh, really a conception of uh, starting a, a balloon angioplasty company just with a balloon that would address um, better qualities of profile and, and passage uh, 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 ability. and. Um, uh, just simply a better balloon for the mid-80s. And uh, at that time, it looked as though it wouldn't be uh, a fruitful business decision to look for a market in the United States where the competition was already giant. So uh, a proposal came to me that, uh, that, that went something like this. There's a... Um, uh, 
uh, a twenty million dollar market uh, worldwide, and uh, there's uh, X amount of uh, uh, a two hundred million dollar market. I think it was at the time, and there's a, a X percentage of this that's foreign, and uh, uh, and there was a business plan, in short, created to uh, take a small portion of the OUS business. Uh, uh, and directed towards arterial vascular engineering, which was a company that was basically started by myself, uh, Jerry Doros, uh, was you know as an interventional physician, um, a few private investors, and um, uh, Brad Gendersey, uh, who uh, was the chief and most critical engineer to us when the company started, and John Miller, who was the um, uh, chief became the chief financial officer. Uh, and had probably the best business sense of anybody. And so we created a business plan that was designed, and uh, I've for, uh, long since forgotten the details of that business plan, but it was designed to get 10% of, I think, a $200 million market, and a $20 million business was considered uh, by the investors to be not a bad thing to try to do in markets where you wouldn't be competing with ACS and USCI because they were so remote that uh, we might be traveling to them to start angioplasty, but they weren't really uh, first on the list for distribution from the big American companies. And that was the, uh, uh, the original focus. And so they were in a position to develop a, um, a conveyance for the stent that I was working on third or so where I said, you know, this may really work. This has got some features that I'd like to see, but we can't deliver it properly. And um, we brought it to AVE against the protest of one of its officers who said, don't defocus the engineers. And Because uh, it was essentially a balloon cat company at the time. That's correct. That is correct. And so uh, I was so impressed with how they were able to clean up the manufacturing of the device and its features and its integration with the balloon system that I felt it was a giant leap forward over what was going to become available as the first available stent in the United States and even the first available stent in Europe. So you were still two years away from, I mean, 1992 when you brought the stent to AV, to AV we were still two years away from the launch of stents in the U.S. In, in the U.S. I, I know it's a sense. It's only two years. It seems like about ten. <laughs> <laughs> what I know it's a it's a delicate issue. So if you can if you can speak around it, but what was innovative? Because the the success of AV was really driven by the stent technology. What was different about AV stent than the other stents that were in development at the time? Well, uh, all I can say about it today is be, uh, is 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 going to be somewhat limited by the uh, the fact that. Some of these large companies are still trying to adjudicate uh, some of the characteristics of these devices. So I, I will dance around that a little bit, except to say for purposes of instruction that if you took the AVE stent and its design and, and aligned it with the AVE balloon as developed uh, by Gendersee and, and Lashinsky, who are two of the best engineering minds I've ever seen in interventional cardiology, not that there aren't uh, scores of others, but those are the two that I, that, that I had the, the privilege of working with. They created something that was, uh, uh, that was so much easier to deal with. It was the first stent that could go uh, almost anywhere the balloon could go. Mm -hmm. It was the first stent that could go stent in stent. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if I'm the first person to ever put a stent in a stent, but I can tell you I did it with the AVE stent in Singapore or Jakarta or somewhere when uh, we were trying to deal with what looked like an impossible situation whereby one company's stent had with great difficulty been seated and then it looked like, oh my God, we've got to go distal to that. And the only thing at that time which was going to work was uh, the AVE stent, its design and its delivery and so on. And the best way to analogize it, because it doesn't seem uh, as though it has the same impact today because so much time has gone by, 10 years or so have gone by, um, I remember as a, as a young fellow after the Second World War, when General Motors stopped making tanks, they started to make automobiles again. And my father was very interested in automobiles. And uh, uh, 
he took me out one day and 